Hey Gateway, happy Mother's Day Sunday. Moms, it's your special day and we celebrate you. Whether you're a biological mom, a stepmom, a foster mom, or any other kind of mom there might be, we wanna thank you for the role that you've played in our lives. We really wouldn't be here without you. Gateway, thank you so much for your generosity in this season. We believe that generosity is our privilege and you have done just that this season. You have continued to help us move church forward. We've been a blessing to our city and been able to stay faithful to our overseas missions commitments. And because of your generosity, we believe that we can stay faithful to the mission that God has called us to, pointing people to Jesus and celebrating changed lives. So there's three ways that you can continue to be generous in your giving. One, you can give online. Two, you can text to give. And three, you can drop your offerings off right here at the church. And hey, if you're watching with us today, we want to know that you're watching. So drop us some love in the comments and let us know what your Sunday morning is looking like. And now let's get ready to worship together. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. It's so nice to come together and praise the Lord again. Let's come together in spirit and in truth and praise Him. Yeah. What fortune lies beyond the stars Those dazzling heights too vast to climb I got so high to fall so far but I found heaven as love swept low, my heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I laid it down, I worked falling, spirit soaring. I touched the sky when my knees hit the ground. What treasure waits within your scars? The gift of freedom gold can buy. I bought the world and sold my heart. You traded heaven to have me again. My heart beating, my soul breathing. I found my life when I laid it down. I poured falling. Spirit soaring, I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. Found me here at your feet again, everything I am, reaching out, I surrender, come sweep me up in your so we'll dance all the wings of forever find me here at your feet again everything i am reaching out i surrender and sweep me up in your love again and my soul will dance on the wings of forever my heart beating my soul breathing i found
Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory, Lord. Oh! 
Thank you so much, Mike and Jerfel and Rebecca, for leading us into worship this morning. We so appreciate your ministry. And, and so good morning, Gateway, and any other Corona conquerors that might be joining us for our online service this morning. We're just so happy to be getting together in this way. We're apart, but we're together in Jesus' name. And uh, how are you doing anyway? How's it going with the whole uh, physical distancing thing? You know, the little sets of footprints that are painted on the floor every six feet in the store. Are you seeing those footsteps in your sleep yet? Is anybody getting tired of waiting in lineups? Uh, I remember hearing about the guy who walked into a store one day and, and, uh, and then when, when he got in the lineup, it seemed like he was waiting, waiting, waiting for a long time. Finally, when it was his turn, he came up to the counter and it's one of these places where they have a senior's discount. And the cashier said to him, uh, sir, are you a senior? He said, well, I wasn't when I came in, but I think I am now. <laughs> I don't know how you're doing with those lineups, but uh, I can tell you that this COVID-19 is a test of patience, but I believe that we are passing the test. Are you with me on that? All right, well, listen, before we dig into this teaching session this morning, would you all repeat after me? I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel, my pride and passion is to follow his example. Say this, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say a bold amen? All right, this is part two of a four-week teaching series that we began last Sunday. And the series is called This Means War. It's based on 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And last week we read the first 13 verses of that chapter. It's, it's about a guy by the name of Jehoshaphat. He's the good guy in the story. He's the king of Judah. And in this chapter he receives word that some foreign armies have joined forces and they're heading his way. And uh, they're up to no good. They're in attack mode and, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a promising report. These armies are coming to get us, basically. And so King Jehoshaphat calls all of Judah, that's his jurisdiction, and he calls all the people of Judah to fast and pray and call on the Lord. And then he leads the people in prayer. And you got to love the way Jehoshaphat concludes his prayer in verse 12. I mean, for goodness sake, it even rhymes. He says, Lord, we know not what to do, but our eyes are on you. Don't you appreciate that prayer? I mean, it's just that simple theology right there, but that's so rich. That's so keeping it real. Lord, we don't know what to do about this report we've received, but our eyes are on you. We're waiting on you, Lord. And, and so we pick it up in verse 14 this morning, and we're going to find out here what the, the Lord tells Jehoshaphat that his next move should be. So follow with me from verse 14 of 2 Chronicles. Chapter 20, here we go. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph. As he stood in the assembly, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. I repeat, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. How's that for a thus saith the Lord? I mean, just try to imagine the collective sense of, of relief that Jehoshaphat and company were feeling. 
right about then. Verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men. Now listen to this. He appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for, his, for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army. So he appoints these men to lead the way. And they were singing, Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. And they were defeated. You really could say they were self-defeated because here's what it says. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah, that's Jehoshaphat's guys, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Wow. The army of Judah didn't even have to draw a sword like easiest victory ever. Folks, when we say this means war, what does that mean? What does that entail? This means war. I see four answers to that question in this 20th chapter. And the first one we looked at last Sunday, and it's this. This means war means I am not happy with the situation at hand. So this means war is an emotional response to a bad circumstance. And Jehoshaphat was upset, not just because an enemy army was bearing down on him for no reason, but because it was the combined armies of three groups of people that Israel, some 540 years earlier. Now, Jehoshaphat knew his history. The problem was these enemy armies, they didn't know their history. Because Jehoshaphat even referenced this in his prayer, verses 10 and 11. He said, Lord, these are the same nations, these are the same armies that we showed mercy to way back in our history. And now they're coming to attack us? you got to be kidding. And so, in the days of Joshua, they had spared them. But now they were coming against Judah. So no wonder King Jehoshaphat is like, this means war. So I'm not happy with this situation. But that was last week's session. Today, let's move on because the second connotation that is carried by this expression is this. This means war suggests, I am going to rally the troops. I'm going to rally the troops. In other words, I am not going to try to wage this war alone. I mean, who goes to war by themselves, right? You see, when we say this means war, we're talking about reinforcements. We're talking about calling for backup, right? A support system, a team effort. It means that we're in this thing together. That's been a, a familiar catchphrase during this war against COVID-19, hasn't it? You see, even from the time that we're kids, we think in terms of rallying the troops, you know, recruiting some help. Somebody wants to pick a fight with you on the school schoolyard and you're like, oh, you want to fight? Okay, I'm going to call my friends. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're going to call your friends? Well, I'm going to call my friends and I'm going to get my big brothers. Who are you going to get? Your little sisters? Ha <laughs> ha. Even as kids, we grasp this concept of rallying the troops, recruiting help for our side. <laughs> the point is, when you go to war, you need some comrades. So Jehoshaphat says, this means war, as in, I am not at all happy with this situation, and I'm going to do something about it. 
And secondly, he says, this means war as in, I am going to rally the troops. So let's quickly review some of the verses that we see in this chapter where, where there is this strategy of conscripting help. First of all, back in verse 3, it says alarm. So he receives this report of this oncoming allied army. And it says alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. So no exceptions. This was mandatory. Everybody fast and pray. Don't eat anything. Just get before the Lord. Verse 4 says this. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah. From all over Judah, they came from every town to seek the Lord. Hmm. They were all in. The whole tribe. Notice in verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. You know, even kids, even kids know when something is up, when there's some problem, there's some issue, there's, there's something that calls for, for prayer, there's something serious going on. Even kids know when, when something is out of the ordinary. You know, Daddy, what's a virus? <laughs> Ask your mother. <laughs> Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. So the king humbly worshipped God, and the entire congregation followed suit. There was some kind of a unity happening right then and there. Then also in verse 21 it says, after consulting the people. So Jehoshaphat's like, I have an idea. We're going to try something a little different this time, folks. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. Wow, that's a different approach. But we see in that verse, there were three units. There were the consultants, there was the worship team, and there was the army. A very unconventional military strategy. Send the choir out ahead of the army. So King Jehoshaphat, according to verse 3, he was alarmed. But he did not panic. He didn't freak out. He had the presence of mind to call for help. Called for divine help and also human help. Now next week, we're going to talk about the divine intervention that came into play here. But let's talk today about the human help that we desperately need when there's a situation unfolding around us that provokes us to say, this means war. So. Jehoshaphat rallied the troops. But listen, not just the trained soldiers, but civilians as well. The whole tribe. You know, back in World War II, they coined a phrase. You may have heard of it. They, they referred to the war effort. What does that mean, the war effort? It means everybody does their part. Not just on the war front, but also on the home front. See, while, while the, the, the guys were fighting on the front lines over in Europe, meanwhile, back home, factories were retooling their equipment to produce items that would be helpful in the war instead of producing the items that they normally would be producing during peacetime. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because we see the same thing has been happening for many companies during this COVID-19 season. You know, in one of his books, Norman Vincent Peale, he was, he was expressing how that back during the war time, World War II, there was an expression that was popularized and it went like this, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Can I run that by you again? They used to talk about use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. You see, it was kind of a mentality of resourcefulness. 
There was rationing of food supplies across America and other countries involved with the war. There was sacrifices being made all in favor of the war effort. Everyone doing their part to help the cause of winning the war in whatever way he or she could. You see, war effort is joint effort. It's total team effort. Many were back on the home front. They were praying for the boys that were at the battlefront. Is that important? Yeah, that's crucial. So listen, when Jehoshaphat and the singers and the army, when they went out to meet the enemy, what about those women and children that we read about? Even the little ones. Well, what about them? Do you, do you think they stayed back in Jerusalem when the others went out to the battle? Or do you think they went with? Well, obviously. They stayed back in Jerusalem. So next question. Do you suppose that those women and, and children and the youth who were not old enough to go to war, do you think that they were praying while they were hanging back in Jerusalem? Absolutely, of course. There's no doubt they were praying. Everybody's participation counts in one way or the other. You see, this means war means I'm going to rally the troops. I'm going to recruit some help. You stay here and pray while I go yonder and engage the enemy. I didn't say you stay here and play. I said you stay here and pray. Don't you love it when you connect with someone who genuinely wants to help you. Isn't that a good thing in life? Somebody, somebody becomes your friend and, and, and they, re, they care about you enough to want to, to help you. I mean, it sure beats the alternative, right? You know, one day there was two guys that went for a bike ride. Only thing is they were riding what they call a bicycle built for two. You ever had that experience? I have. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely a test of coordination at first, but Here's these two guys out on this bicycle built for two. It's a great illustration, isn't it, of helping one another. Anyway, as they're riding along, off in the distance, they see a big hill coming. And they confer together and say, let's go for it. Let's see if we can make it up to the top of that hill. And so they get going and, and they build up some, some speed and they hit that hill. And about halfway up the hill, they're, they're losing momentum pretty fast. And finally, they made it up to the top of the hill, just barely. And they stop. And the guy on the front of the bike, he's huffing and puffing. And he says, oh, man. That was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. And the guy on the back said, yeah. And he said, it's a good thing I kept the brakes on all the way up or we could have rolled down backwards and wiped out. <laughs> now listen, the point of that story is, let me get this straight. Are you working with me or against me? Folks, if you're going to make it in life, you got to learn how to recruit some help along the way, especially when there are some of those, those testy situations where, where uh, just circumstances are pressing in and you find it necessary to say this means war and you can't do it alone. You need to recruit some help. Listen, when we make that personal decision to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, how many of you understand what I mean when I say not only are you introduced to Jesus, your new best friend forever. Not only are you introduced to your Savior theologically, but when you, you know, come on board in the family of God, you are also introduced to a whole new set of family members, a whole new set of friends. I'm talking about people who can help us in a wide variety of of ways. That's the design of this family of God, this kingdom of God. We all with our multivarious giftings and callings, we're able to encourage and bless and, and help each other out. So when you when you introduce to Jesus, man, there's a package deal here. You you become introduced to uh, just a wealth of of other uh, friends and and fellow believers, people that can encourage you and people that you can encourage that that comes with membership in the family of God so now listen just hold that thought about helping one another because 
just for a moment, I want to come back to this question of how do I get in on this deal? How do I become a part of this outfit? Because that sounds pretty good. I've had a few lonely days and, and I could use a couple of extra friends in my circle. So how do I get in on that deal? Because I do not want to go through this message this morning and just make the assumption that, hey, everybody out there that's taking in this service probably automatically understands what it means to be a Christian and how to become a Christian. I don't want to make that assumption. Possibly some of you are listening today and no one has ever taken the time to sit down and explain to you the simple terms of the gospel. So let me just put it quickly in a nutshell for you because this is, this is so uh, crucial. This is, this is what it's all about. This is how we find ourselves in Christ, in the family of God, so that we can then proceed to live a brand new life, and it's called the Christian life. Here's, here's the deal. We get it that, that Adam and Eve got us all into trouble when they committed that original sin. So one man sinned, it says in Romans chapter 5, and therefore the entire human race are all pronounced guilty in the sight of God. So one man and his wife wrecked it for all of us, but that's where Jesus comes into, pic into the picture because it also says in Romans chapter 5 that based on one man's obedience to God, that be Jesus, all of us can be reinstated. We all, on an individual basis, can be, can be uh, restored back into right relationship with our Heavenly Father. We just need to, 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 to look at the cross and understand why Jesus died. Because when He came, He was assuming all of our sin. Everything about us that was offensive to God, Jesus took responsibility for that. That's why we call Him the sacrificial Lamb of God. He bore all of our sin and all the judgment that our sin warranted. And the Father was so perfectly satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus on behalf of you and I that He said, that's good enough for me. I'm prepared to just welcome people back into my family and eventually into heaven when the time is right, He's prepared to welcome us back into His family based on what Jesus accomplished through His death and resurrection. So when we get it that Jesus was really dealing with our sin issues on that cross, and so we put our faith in Him, we say, Lord, please forgive me my sin. I need to be spiritually reborn. I need this gift of salvation. I need redemption because I'm stuck in the mud of a fallen sin nature. So this is the good news of the gospel. And, and when, we, when we tune in to what Jesus accomplished for us and simply apply our faith to what Jesus secured for us through His death and resurrection, then the good news is that, that we become spiritually reborn. And now we can get on with living as genuine followers of Jesus Christ. And, and, and when that happens, of course, now there's so much that becomes available to us. And one of the things that we stand to, to benefit from as followers of Christ is that others who are also followers of Christ can be a tremendous source of blessing and strength and encouragement to us. So as Christians, we, we quickly figure out, hey, everybody needs the Lord. Everybody needs the Lord. Some won't admit that, but that doesn't change the fact that everybody needs the Lord. That's a universal need. The other thing that we quickly figure out is we need one another. Oh yeah, we need one another. If you're sitting with somebody in the same room right now, just turn to them and say, we need one another. And that should ring true because Christianity is a team sport, my friend. It's, it's a support system. It's a body. The Apostle Paul uh, explained it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He, he said the family of God, it's like a human body and Jesus is the head of the body and all of us are the various members, the various parts of the body and, and, and we need one another. We, we need the head lest we become uh, you know, decapitated and we certainly need one another lest we become dismembered and, and so the body functions well together when we connect with each other, when we pull together. You know, in 
uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, there's a very touching story there about teamwork. There were five guys, and they opened a hamburger's no, no, pardon me, that's, that's a different five guys. There were, there were five guys, and four of them were able-bodied and very healthy. But the fifth buddy in that circle was paralyzed. Yeah, he, we call him the paralytic in, in the Gospels. But his four buddies, they, they recognized his need, and they were determined, they were declaring war on paralysis. You could put it that way. They said to, to their, their paralyzed friend, they said, we are taking you to Jesus. We've heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. He performs miracles right, left, and center. We're going to take you. And many of you know the story. They showed up at the place where Jesus was conducting ministry, but the crowd was so thick, there was no way they could get in to the building where Jesus was, was holding a service. And so they, they, they went up on the rooftop and they began to tear away the, the, the roof tiles and, and they attached a, a rope to each one of the four corners of the stretcher that they'd carried their, their buddy on. And, and, and together, as, as, as teammates, they lowered, they lowered the, the, the stretcher down right in front of Jesus. Well, of course, the long story made short is Jesus said, take up your mat and walk. And it was a phenomenal miracle. That guy was restored to full health that day. But, but the point is, these men were determined to overcome that paralysis issue that they saw in their friend. Apparently they would prefer to carry his stretcher to Jesus than carry his casket to the cemetery. They wanted to be friend bearers instead of Paul bearers. You know, some years ago, here in Regina, we were at one of the Promise Keepers events and the speaker challenged us men. Promise Keepers, of course, is a men's ministry. And, and the speaker challenged us. He said, guys, who will be your pallbearer? You know, in the event that you go before you get raptured out of here. Who are your pallbearers going to be? Who are your close friends? Who are your go-to guys? Who are the guys that will go to war with you? Who are those, those ones that will pray for you? Those, those ones that will stick with you in, in difficult times when you're in a war zone, personally. Who are those guys that you have a close connection with? When you need to rally the troops, who are they? It's really something to think about. You know, over the years, there's been, well, there's been so many times when we've officiated funerals. But there have been some occasions when I felt like, man, I don't want to be officiating at this funeral. I'm happy to do it. But I'd rather be sitting sitting down there with those pallbearers, or at least honorary pallbearers. Because I felt a close connection. I felt a close kinship and friendship with the person who had passed away. You know, that happened recently, our dear Merv Neal. I'm pretty sure that most all of you know by now that several weeks ago, Merv passed away, he graduated, and he's gone to be with the Lord, and we were not able to have a, uh, what we would call a regular uh, memorial service for Merv. We did an online memorial service, but there was a case where if there had been pallbearers, I would really want to be one of them, not just officiating at that service. You know, true story. During World War II, there were soldiers from some of the other Commonwealth countries that came to do their training here in Canada. And one of those spots was a place called Manning Depot. It was in Brandon, Manitoba, fairly close to home here. And the story is told that one night there was a couple of Australian soldiers. They were returning to the barracks, but they were well past curfew. And there was a couple of members of the base security force that tried to confront these Australian soldiers. And, and, uh, and, and they, they, the, but those soldiers, they resisted and they brushed past these security personnel and they disappeared into the night. However, in the scuffle that took place, one of the security guys got a hold of one of those brass buttons from the uniform of one of those Australian soldiers, and, and it was still in his hand after they took off. 
And so these security guys felt that there was no way they'd be able to replace that brass button between then and the morning. And, and so the following day they thought, we'll know at least one of the two guys, we'll know exactly who they are because when they line up on the parade square, square <laughs> the parade, easy for you to say, when they line up on the parade square for inspection, <laughs> the guy who has one brass button missing on his uniform He's the guy, and we'll know he'll be incriminated by that missing brass button. And so, sure enough, the following morning when all of the soldiers lined up on the parade square for inspection, <laughs> all 30 members of the Australian unit, unit were all missing one brass button. And that, my friends, is what you call solidarity among the ranks. You know, all for one and, and one for all. Folks, all of us will face situations in life that move us to say this means war. Boy, it's so good to have some people that we can call on in those times of need. This means war as in I am not happy with this situation. And this means war as in I am going to rally the troops. I'm going to recruit some help. So basically, this requires two things of us. One is this, you have to be intentional about not being stubbornly independent. You know, many have done this. They've been facing some sort of a, a difficult situation, but, but they tried to just muddle through on their own. I can do this. I can handle this myself. Yeah, famous last word. Now, suffering in silence. Suffering secret, secretly. You cannot be an army of one. Reminds me of the story about the lady who went to a Home Depot type store. She needed some, uh, some hardware for hanging pictures on, on her walls at home. So she described to the clerk what it was she wanted to do. and He said, oh ma'am, what you need is a stud finder. She got this indignant look on her face and she said, I do not need a man. I can do this project myself. <laughs> How many of you know that a stud finder is not to be confused with a matchmaker, right? A stud finder, it's just a handy dandy little gadget that will help you to figure out where the, the, uh, the wooden two by four is inside the wall behind that gyp rock. <laughs> That's what a stud finder is. You see, the point is, if you're fiercely independent, you may find it difficult to recruit some help or for that matter to find a marriage partner. But listen, you have to become intentional about this. I admit, I tend to be independent, but I realize I cannot do this by myself. I need some input. I need some assistance from others. So I'm not going to just stubbornly do this on my own. I'm going to find some help. And then secondly, the other, the other part of this is you have to be intentional about soliciting help. Don't hesitate to ask. Come on, church. We need one another. Can I say it again? We need one another. I can hear some of you offering up your amens right where you sit. For example, suppose you're not happy about being way far in debt. This means war. You know, if you have a spouse, this has got to be a joint declaration of war. See, because if one of you is, is like, hey, uh, 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 we got to declare war on debt, <laughs> and, and one of you is, is really gung-ho, you know, we're, honey, we're going to start tithing. We should have been doing that all along. We're going to curb all of the careless spending. We're going we're to cut up those credit cards. We're going we're to go with a new policy where we just save up and then pay cash instead of credit. And on and on down the list. We're going to whittle away at this debt load. If one of you is really passionate about this, but the other one isn't really going along with it, it's not going to work. You've got to help each other if this is going to be successful. Pretty sure we all can understand that. You're going to declare war on debt, man, it's got to be a team effort. Here's another example. If you declare war on an addiction, you know, some habitual behavior pattern, 
You need to recruit some help. You got to go to support group meetings. You need to get in the ear of a few trusted friends and tell them what you're doing and ask them to pray for you, to encourage you, or even to keep you accountable. You see, recovery is so much easier with a support system. In fact, it's virtually impossible without it. One guy wanted to lose X number of, of pounds and break the habit of unhealthy eating, so he asked his, his buddy to become his, his accountability partner, and he sat down with him and explained how that system works, and, and his buddy said, great, great, I'll be happy to do that. So late one night, <clears throat> this man called up his, his, his new accountability partner, and he said, man, I am so craving a double whopper uh, combo. <laughs> He said, I'm really, really tempted to get in the truck and go to Burger King. And his buddy said, awesome, I'll go with you. Don't be that guy. Folks, sometimes we preach what we should do. Sometimes we preach what we shouldn't do. Well, in this case, that's what we should not do. Listen, let me give you one more example. Suppose you have a health issue. You know, some kind of a disease or an infirmity, infirmity an injury, or just something is the matter with your body don't just struggle alone rally the troops round up some help get some people praying for you talk to others and see what they think you should do about this physical situation you know proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says in the multitude of counselors there is safety Remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, if any two of you shall as, uh, agree as touching any, any matter, it will be done. In other words, you pray the, the prayer of agreement together. Get some people in your corner who speak the language of faith. How many times have people called the church to ask for prayer regarding this, that, or the other thing, and next thing you know, we've, we've got that, that message going out via social media to a prayer team tell you, we've had some pretty amazing results because of that. Listen, whatever the issue might be, this means war calls for rallying the troops. I tell you what, there's really something to be said for having some people that you can turn to in time of, of need. I conclude with this. There was a young lady and her fiancé. They were driving their their car down the street one day and they went by this house and parked out front of the house was was a vehicle and in the window of that vehicle there was a sign that said for sale well it turns out this this lady she was in the market for a good used vehicle and she really liked the look of that car and so they pulled over she she went to the door and and she talked to to the guy who was the owner of the car and he was telling her a little bit about the vehicle and and how much he was asking for it. And she said, wow. She said, I don't really know anything about cars, you know, what's under the hood and stuff, but I know someone who does. Could I come back tomorrow morning and, 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 and we could take this for a, a test drive and a, a, I could get this guy to, to check it out? And, and, and the owner of the vehicle said, that would be fine. So she came back the following morning with her brother because her brother was a mechanic and knew about vehicles. So they took a test drive and, and he said, this is a really good car for this price. I think you should buy it. So she went back to the guy who was the owner of the, the car, and he, she said, I'll take it. Can I come back after work today to pay you? He said, that would be fine. So later in the day, she came back with her cousin because her cousin was really good with financial matters and paperwork and insurance for vehicles and how to seal the deal, how to do an e-transfer, all that kind of stuff. He was really adept with, with that sort of thing. And so she brought her cousin with her. And, and, uh, and so they, they, they got the, the deal concluded. And, and she said to the, to the fellow that was selling the car to her, you know, we've got to go over to the insurance office to get some plates. And I don't think we're going to make it back the bridge. Uh, back across the bridge in, in time for, for tonight. Uh, so could I come back tomorrow on my lunch break from work to actually pick up the car? He said, that would be fine. So the next day she got one of her co-workers on, on lunch hour, which was a guy, to, to drive her over so she could pick up her new vehicle. And, 
And so the man who was selling the car to her, when he saw this guy, this is the fourth guy now that he has seen this lady with. First was her fiance when they first spotted the car, and then her brother, the mechanic, to check it out, and, and then her cousin to seal the deal, and now her co-worker to drop her off so she can pick up the car. And the guy selling the car to her said, uh, excuse me, but how many boyfriends do you have anyway? <laughs> I love that story, but you know, I said that so I could say this. That this was kind of a car purchase by committee, right? She had a team like a vehicle acquisition staff unofficially. Now, purchasing a car is not declaring war, folks. But listen carefully. It is such a valuable thing in life to be surrounding yourself with a handful of people who know how to sing, lean on me even if they don't know all the words, all the lyrics, even if they can just hum it. <laughs> so awesome to have some people in your life that you can lean on them, and hey, they can lean on you as well. This means war means I am going to rally the troops. I'm going to recruit some help. And what a difference that is going to make. As we wrap up this session today. Can we just become prayerful right now? You know how to do that. Let's just be quiet before the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Would you allow the Holy Spirit right now just to help you, to empower you, to make a decision? Would you choose wisely in cooperation with the Spirit of God right now, to be intentional about quit being so independent. I can do this on my own. No, you can't. We all need others. So would you be intentional about losing the independent spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to help you to choose very wisely to become intentional about seeking out close relationships, people that you value and people that value you, people that can become very instrumental in helping you to overcome some of the difficulties of life. When you find yourself in a situation where you need to say, this means war, you need some others that can come alongside and pray in agreement with you and empower you in your walk with the Lord people that you can confide in, people that you can count on. Just even start with one. Start with one person and then add to your collection. But be intentional about reaching out for help. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you like that this morning? And I believe that as you do that, this is going to make a very significant difference. You're going to chalk up some victories because you are smart in Jesus' name to rally the troops. One other point, and it's really an important one. I don't know, but possibly some people have tuned in to this online service this morning, and you've never made that all-important decision that I alluded to a little earlier. It's the decision to say, Jesus, would you please come into my life, forgive my sin, and be the Savior of my soul. It's about time I became spiritually reborn and get on with this brand new start in life that I know you have for me. Lord, I want to follow you. If you've never made that sincere decision before or if you made it a long time ago but somehow you've drifted, you've gotten away from the Lord and, and this is the season for you to, to get back on track with Jesus, would you pray this simple prayer in good faith? Let's pray this. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and be the Savior of my soul, the Savior of my future, the Savior of my family line. Lord Jesus, forgive me for all that I've ever done wrong. Wash me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life in relationship with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
well, hey, you know what, Mike and Jerfel and Rebecca are going to come and they're going to lead us in one more song before we officially wrap up our service this morning. But I would just like to say to every one of you mothers that have tuned in for this Mother's Day online service this morning, moms, we love you, we bless you, and, and may you be crowned today with, with the grace of God and may you just thoroughly enjoy your time of visiting with family and friends. Amen. God bless you, Gateway. Sundays with us are one of the highlights of your week and something that you so look forward to. We believe that the local church is God's best idea and we're so happy that we can be a part of it. We want to remind you to stay connected to us online this week and if you haven't yet joined one of our Zoom Connect groups, why don't you do that this week? And hey, make sure you treat mom extra good today because it's her special day. Moms, we love you so much. We hope you have a great day and we look forward to seeing you all right back here next Sunday.